everything is calculable and we're always trying to be enough. We're always hoping we're enough, but enough actually means something quantifiable. To be enough would mean there's a baseline that you have to hit in order to reach it. And you are immeasurable. You are immeasurable. You are quantum. You are perfect. And we don't need to try to be enough because enough is so small compared to what we are. Introducing The Vixen Voice, a podcast for ambitious women entrepreneurs ready to move into their feminine essence, live their truth, and unlock their full potential. I'm your host, April Roberts, and each week I'll be interviewing inspiring women who decided to take a leap of faith to pursue their dream. Women who believe that they were born for something bigger. Hello and welcome. I'm so excited because today we have Kira Doyle with us. Kira is a global human design expert and facilitator who founded Meeting Your Magic, a company and community on a mission to help others find their sense of purpose and fulfillment. Now, she's really cool because her unique blend of experience, including writing, yoga, hairdressing, corporate education, and TEDx speaking has allowed her to offer a holistic approach to personal growth. She is authenticity obsessed, her words, and I love that. You'll hear why as we go in with the show. And this is evident when you work with her. If you spend too much time with Kiara, you'll be inspired and convinced that Everything you desire is possible, and who doesn't want that? So, Kira, welcome. Thanks so much for joining us today. This is so fun. April, thank you so much for having me. And as I'm listening you intro me, I'm just thinking, I'm so glad April has a podcast because you, like your voice as you're speaking, is just so magnetic. I love it. Oh, well, thank you so much. So what I love to share with the audience is, you know, that's your official bio, but I love to share why I think you're awesome and why we had you on the show. The purpose of our show is really to inspire women to think outside of the box. Like, what else could I be doing? What do I really want to be doing? Because I personally believe, you know, we're all created and this goes to exactly what you do. We were created by the higher power that you believe in to do a certain purpose here on earth. And so it's not our spouse's purpose. It's not our children's purpose. It's not our parents' purpose. And so it's really important that we self-discover so we can fulfill that purpose. So um, you and I met because I found you on Instagram. So I love it. And I signed up for your complimentary energy. Uh, what is it? The energy quiz. You can talk about it a little bit more. Oh, yeah. 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 The get your free human design chart. <laughs> yes. Yes. So yes. of course I downloaded it. I'm like, I don't know what the heck this is. I better schedule a session. And so we had our session. I think it was an hour and a half. It was crazy how generous you were with your time. It was amazing. And then you and I continued to talk for 30 minutes because we had so much in common in our journey. So I'm, I'm so excited that you've come into my world that you're this amazing person and that we have time to continue that conversation today. So thank you. I'm so excited to be here. Thank you. And I just remember really falling in love with your energy on our conversation. I was like, I can't, this woman has a fire under her (laughs) and I can't wait to see what she does. So I was so excited when you reached out about the podcast. Awesome. Well, what I'd like to do is if you wouldn't mind, share a little bit of your story. So What our audience likes to hear is what's maybe a pivotal moment in your life where you made a big decision or went through something that made you this beautiful, amazing woman we're seeing today. I was thinking about this before we got on the call and I can really dial it all down to one moment. And the moment felt at the time, like my life was falling apart. I think sometimes we have like big moments in lives where incredible things come to us and that's our life-changing moment. And then I also think sometimes we hit a rock bottom and when we have the breakdown, we kind of have the breakthrough. And so my beginning of my 20s, I mean, I've never had the best timing, I guess you could say, with any milestone in life. I'm always coming up against 
a time of struggle. I graduated college during the recession. 2009 is when I went shining out into the world looking for a job. Long story, but later in life, my husband and I scheduled our long awaited wedding for 2020. We're like, it's good. 2020 is going to be our year. We had to postpone that. We bought a house last year during the crazy market. Like my timing has always just been funny, I think, but it's built a lot of resilience. But I will say that, you know, moving into a career, I always knew I wanted to go into the beauty industry. I wasn't sure exactly what it was going to look like. I knew I wanted to do it. And I took a very winding path to get there. So I went to college for writing. I started working at a hair salon as a receptionist and eventually a manager. And then I got a job in PR, decided that wasn't for me, moved to New York City in this big, brave moment with nothing but a duffel bag and lived on a friend's couch. And I went through yoga teacher training instead of going to hair school. I just thought, oh, that'll be, that'll be a fun little thing to do on the side. And then eventually brought myself through cosmetology school. At this point, I am 26 years old and I think I'm a dinosaur. Everyone in cosmetology school is 18, 19, maybe 20 max. And I remember thinking, I'm so behind and I have so much catching up to do. And when I get my first job in the hair salon, I have to buckle down and commit and do whatever it takes to rise above. And so after I graduated from school, and meanwhile, while I was working in school or while I was in school, I was working full time to pay my school tuition. And so my schedule looked like school from nine to five and then working in a, in a nightclub from 6 a.m. to 3 a.m. And that's how I was getting by paying my rent, paying for school. And I kept telling myself, you just have one more year. You know, we do that to ourselves sometimes. We're like, you can push through. You've got this. It's just this. As soon as I graduate, I end up getting a job, I mean, within the week of graduation at this really cool, swanky downtown salon in New York City in the meatpacking. And they had a very rigorous apprenticeship program. And it was going to take you about two years to get through the program and blood, sweat, tears. You know, you're kind of treated like the hair on the ground at the salon, like that's where you are. And I come through this experience and I have to say from day one, walking through those doors, something felt off. And every day it just continued to feel worse and worse and worse and worse. It was the culture. It was the way I was being treated, but it was more than even anything I can verbally express. It was just a feeling in my body that felt like I was sinking. A part of me was just like sinking back in a way, didn't want to be there. I really saw myself, if I keep fighting for this career to be here and move up this ladder, I look around and I don't even know who I want to be here. There's no one whose lives look like I want my life to be. I don't like how they speak to each other. I don't like how they talk about their client. Like the whole thing just felt so out of alignment. And so eventually I had to have a knee surgery. I had a prior injury that came up. And so the universe gifted me like one month off during the summer. Wow. I couldn't go to my job and I was home and I was thinking about leaving. And I thought, what if I never go back? And all of my body was like, yes, don't go back. Don't go back. It's toxic. Don't do it. But I forced myself to go back. Now, April, you cannot make this up. Two days back at work from my knee surgery, and I still have a knee brace on, I fall down a flight of stairs and break my opposite foot. (laughs) I broke my opposite foot. So now I have a broken foot on my right foot and a knee brace on my left knee. And the doctor said, you can stand on it for like light, you know, periods of time. There's really, sometimes you break your foot. Mine was like right between my toes and there's really nothing you can do. It's not like I needed to sit back and just elevate it for days on end. It's more of just like, it's going to heal over time. Be gentle. Don't do anything crazy. Don't walk too much, but you can stand. So I thought, all right, I'll just go back. I'll go back to work. So I went back to work three days later, broken foot, boot on, knee brace, and I felt in some way that I was, I'd really become like a, a person of conviction mm-hmm. and that I was doing this like badge of honor. Like I'm going to get through this apprenticeship. Like I was thinking universe, you try to knock me down. I get right back up. Like I'm going <laughs> to get back in the game. So one morning I had to go to the doctor's appointment uptown before my downtown session uh, shift, I should say. And I accidentally got through on the door of the wrong side of the subway. I don't know if anyone's ever done this before, but if in New York City, if you have a monthly pass and you scan your monthly pass to go down, go into the subway, it takes 15 minutes to reset and let you back in. Essentially, they want to make sure I'm not going to swipe my pass 
and then pass it to you, April, and it's unlimited and you get a free ride. So after I made this mistake, I realized I now have to wait 15 minutes to go down the right side, you know, get through the door on the right side. And I was like, oh no, I can't do this. I'm going to be late. Now I'm coming from a doctor's appointment with a knee and a foot. Like, why am I so worried about 15 minutes? I was so stressed. I was so in the culture of like, I have to do it right. I have to show up. I have to be this, you know, I'm almost martyr. And I went down through the subway and I ran to the train attendant and I said, I need to get through the subway. I need to get through. I have a monthly pass. If you could please check it for me and just let me through. And she said, ma'am, my machine is broken. I can't let you through. You have to pay or you have to wait. And the line to pay to go through was like 20 people deep. And I said, ma'am, the train is coming in two minutes. Can you please just let me through? Meanwhile, a bunch of people had gotten off one of the other trains and someone opened up the fire escape door, which is basically this huge door you can just walk through. And the alarm is sounding. And my heart is like, ma'am, please, my train is coming. Let me through. And she looks at me and she's like, I can't let you through, but kind of like nodding at the door. And I said, what? She's like, I can't let you through, ma'am. I'm very sorry. Showing me where the door is. And I said, would you please let me? I start crying. And she goes, miss, go through the door. (laughs) Yeah. And I was like, oh, I walked through that door. I walked onto the train right before it left. I walked into the salon. And I put in my two weeks. Finally, I needed someone to give me permission to step out of the matrix, essentially, I had Mm -hmm. created for myself. I needed someone to say, go through the door. And in that moment, I realized that's what the universe had been saying to me the entire time. The door is open. Go through the door. Needing knee surgery... If you have a knee problem, you probably don't need to go back to that salon ever. Then breaking your foot, that's enough, isn't it? Wouldn't do it. Wouldn't do it. I was so self-sacrificial in the name of what I thought I needed to do. And I was so attached to this outcome. And I could not imagine what would happen if I left that salon space. And I have to tell you, that moment in and of itself created one of the most magnetic experiences I've ever had in my life, which was... Three weeks later, I landed a job at one of the biggest beauty brands in the world as a manager, a regional education manager, managing 30 hairdressers. They gave me a company car. I all of a sudden had a salary. I had health benefits and I was being treated as a leader. I mean, it was the, it was a quantum leap from everyone from the outside world. But for me, the guy just been playing so, so, so small, waiting on someone to give me permission to step into the truth, to step into what felt right in my body and what didn't feel right in my body the entire time. That's my moment. I love it. And I love that you can remember how your body felt because I always joke that my 18-year-old self was so much smarter than my 47-year-old self because Mm -hmm. I had more courage. I listened to my intuition. You kind of are sharing the opposite story where you felt so much responsibility at a young age that it held you back. But for so many of us, it's like the responsibility piles as we get older and we get out of touch of listening to our body, seeing the signs. And I think it's so important to come back and life brings us that way. But no, I loved your story. I'm so glad that it was the open the door. I have to tell you, I was a little fearful because I know we we usually get three chances to listen and if you had a broken foot and a, and, a torn, and a torn knee, I was like, oh, no, what's coming third? So I was kind of like, what's coming? God knows. God knows what would have come, right? <laughs> but I also think angels are sent to us. I mean, that's what that woman was for you. And I won't go into it now. But, you know, I had psoriasis when I was like 35, like terribly, like covering my body really affecting my health. It is an autoimmune condition. And I have a similar story where I came back. This is before Uber. And I was visiting my mom. She wanted me to move home because I was so sick. And I owned a business. I'm like, I can't just like close everything and move home. And, you know, the stages of grief. Well, I was at anger. And so I'm getting a cab. 
again before Uber. And the guy didn't help me with my luggage. And I was just so angry. I was like, thank you so much, which I would never treat someone that way. Right. And he was like, it kind of jarred him. And so we got into a conversation and I said, I'm so sorry. I'm sick and I'm just very upset. I I'm apologize for treating you that way. And then he shared with me, oh, I just got diagnosed with diabetes. And so we started having this conversation. Long story short, he had moved here from Africa. And he was like, you know, Western medicine, like you, they just give you a pill for everything. Like there's some other solution, which led me to two weeks later finding like nutrition, probiotics, all these like healthy ways to heal myself. So, I mean, it really is amazing when you're open. Wow. Yeah. And had you not gotten upset, right? You wouldn't have had a reason to apologize and to share your your story of why you were in the state you were in. Yeah, totally. And that's why, you know, I never even thought of it from that design, but we have to we have to unapologetically be ourselves, which is so hard in today's mm-hmm. world. And that's what I love about what you do, because you help us understand who we are and what we're meant to do. So before we dig in a little deeper to your story, because I'd love to hear more, I am going to ask you, because I'm sure our audience who is not familiar with human design is super curious, like, what the heck is human design? <laughs> like, should should I look at this? How can it help me? So let's kind of segue there. And if you don't mind sharing with us. Oh, would love to. So human design is a blend of modern science and ancient astrology, like the I Ching, Kabbalah, the chakra system, as well as quantum physics. And it is essentially like looking at an energetic blueprint of who you are, who you came to be, your energetic gifts, as well as a map of how you are meant to make decisions and move through the world how you were designed to function in this world. And a human design body graph is generated by plugging your exact birth details. So you need your exact birth time or as close as you can get as possible into body graph software, which we do have a link in the show notes for anyone that's curious of their design. And it does generate this beautiful, very complex body graph that serves as this energetic blueprint of of how you came in the world to function. And there are five energy archetypes. So each human design chart is very, very different. But then there's five energy themes of how we really came in the world to exchange energy with the world. And so when I share with human design, that's usually where I start uh, because it's the most general and it's the sort of fastest way for someone to understand their uniqueness in the world without getting into the nitty gritty of the millions of combinations you can see come up in in a human design body graph. It's like it's like astrology meets Myers-Briggs on steroids. <laughs> it, it really is. It really is the coolest thing. And and I know, April, you and I had a session together. So let me know if you agree with this, but I find human design to be so actionable. It's very different than, uh, say, a traditional astrology reading where it's like, Jupiter is going to be squaring your something and da-da-da. And so get ready. Human design is like, look, there's this tendency in you. So try this. You have a defined root center. Try 30 minutes of exercise every day. You have an open G center. Try to make your your interior space feel beautiful. Travel more, right? There's these actionable things we can do inside of the, the work. And that's why I fell in love with it. It's the application of human design that creates the transformation in our lives. And I see evidence every day in my life as well as in my clients' lives. And the more I read and the more I do this work, The more I I don't even believe anymore, I just know. It's just a knowing. Like, I know when you do this, this is going to happen. Watch. And then the universe still blows my mind. (laughs) I know. I know. Well, yeah, I always want to say, so I have this love-hate relationship with goal setting, right? Because I think it's important to have a target. But I also don't want to just be saying, oh, this is all I want. So I try to surrender to the goal versus striving for it. Because what if something greater is meant for me? Or what if something different is meant for me, right? So it's really interesting. And so when I'm working with like female entrepreneurs and my coaching, I'm like, okay, I need you to set a revenue goal. I need an ideal income goal. I need this and this, but give it wiggle room, right? Because I feel like if we are too strict to it, we cut out the magic that potentially can come from things. 
Mm-hmm. And so I think that's what I loved about when we had our session. So I am a projector and you can share the four types and what that means. But I was struggling with a couple of questions in my personal life and professional life. And when I have these moments, I take a lot of time to meditate and pray. And I just kind of take my time until the answer comes. Because like you said, I want to know the direction I'm going. It's not just making a decision, but it's like feeling it in my entire body. Like this is right for me. And so when we talked, you really helped me. I would just gotten out of a relationship and I was like, I was kind of had a lot of questions about, okay, who should I be looking for? Or maybe I'm not meant to be in a relationship. (laughs) Like there were lots of different things. And what you shared with me is because I was close, like one and two, that I actually don't have a soulmate in this life. And maybe I'm restating this wrong, that I really just needed to find someone to enhance who I was. So, and what you said made so much sense to me because a lot of times men are attracted to me by my independence, but then that's also a problem in the relationship, right? And you explained to me that they feel energetically that I don't need them. I might want them, but I don't need them. So that was like, just gave me personally so much peace. So I love that in my personal life. And I was like, okay, I'm just going to go with the flow. <laughs> like, No big deal. But speak up about this and kind of share with other people. And then there was another major thing you helped me with too, I'd love to share. Oh, I love that. So I think what we were referring to was definition. Yes. So in our human design charts, you'll see when you look yours up, you'll see as well, there's something called definition. And when someone has single definition, it essentially means that all of the parts of you that are defined, that parts of you that are you, you can access on your own. You have ac- you have infinite access to yourself. And that you know, other humans come in your life and they can serve as mirrors. They can serve as opportunities for growth, lessons, a good time, romance, fun, adventure. But they're never going to be the you complete me mm-hmm. thing that we're taught when we're younger. And I'm also single definition, April. I don't know about you, but when I watched a lot of, like, I think about very influential films I grew up watching as, as a girl, as a teenager, as a young woman, it always seemed to portray a woman who had something missing. Yeah. And she had to sort of play this, or this was my interpretation of it. She had to sort of play this like, I'm broken, like fix me role. I remember one of my favorite movies. I I love Jerry Maguire, literally the quote, you complete me. But I loved, there was this movie called Crazy Beautiful with uh, Kirsten Dunst. I can't remember the leading actor's name. I think it was one of the most damaging movies I'd ever watched for like myself because it was how I thought you got a partner, which she did have a rough life. Like she did. I mean, her story wasn't my story. And I remember trying to emulate like parts of myself that could be like maybe troubled or like broken or like, like, do I like need to have a breakdown to like attract a partner in Mm -hmm. a factory girl with Edie Sedgwick? I remember why, or or who plays Santa Miller. I was like, I watched that in my early twenties. I was like, I know what I need. Like just dr- a drug prop, which I was never in drugs. I was like, I think I just need like a thing. Like I need a vice. Like I need something that they can come fix, but it didn't translate into my life in a healthy way at all. Mm-hmm. Like I did find myself start emulating this like damsel in distress first, maybe from a conscious state, but then not consciously. Mm-hmm. Then it sort of became my story. I was trying to bring in partners to fill in holes that I didn't really have, but then I kind of had because I created a story in which I had them. It's very, yeah, very strange. <laughs> so first of all, share with our audience how you got past that, because I know you're in a very happy, loving relationship right now. So what helped you get past that? Because I think a lot of us struggle with this. Well, I first want to say that I met my partner, my husband, when in 2013, I had just gotten a job at the toxic salon I was working at. (laughs) I wasn't the person that I am today. And I did enter into my relationship from a very broken state. I remember thinking, this is a man that can take care of me. This is someone that can provide that role for me. And he and I really walked through a difficult evolution when the dynamic switched. He, you know, I, I came in as like, I'm making $8 an hour and sweeping up hair. And I have a dream of being a stylist one day to within, you know, two years later being like, I'm a boss at one of the, at a big beauty brand and da da da. Like, I'm not making you dinner. You know, like I flipped into this very masculine 
I don't need you. Then it's almost like when the career came in and filled in that hole, all of a sudden I had stepped really into my masculine. So our relationship has gone through so many different evolutions. I I would just say what helped me was learning to keep the plug at the bottom of my bathtub plugged in, keeping myself full, making sure my needs are being met, making sure I can love on myself. I can take care of myself, but also not to do it in a way that's this rigid, masculine, I don't need you. Celebrating my partner for how he makes me feel. Like when he does something, rather than comment on like, good job, you clean the kitchen. I'll be like, wow. And I walk in this kitchen, it just makes me feel so good. It looks so beautiful in here. Thank you so much. Really coming back to like how I feel. And a lot of honesty, a lot of conversations. I mean, we did couples therapy before we were even married. Like we've moved through a lot of evolution. And I think that as I grow and he grows and we change, it's just coming back to, do we still have the same desire for the outcome of our lives? Do we still want to walk this path together? And the answer is yes. And so we just go back at it. But like, I've been, I want to say I've been at least four different versions of me inside of this relationship. And I'm really grateful that I have found a partner who can hold them all, but it's not always easy. It's not always easy. And I would say to the woman who wants to get into a relationship, I think back of like all of the things I would have done differently if I was magnetizing someone now, or if I had magnetized even my partner from a healed state It would really be demonstrating to my partner how I want to be loved by how I treat myself. It would be not waiting for him to say, I'm going to buy you flowers or I'm going to take you, I'm going to bring you coffee in bed. Like I would be a living demonstration of what it looks like to love me. And you can step on in and add to that and add value to it or not. But I truly believe we teach our partners how to love us by how we love ourselves. Yeah. And it's harder work when you're in a relationship and then you want to reteach them. Like, this is how I love on me now. It's different, right? But 10 years in, we're, he's still learning and I'm still learning. <laughs> I love it. We're learning all our life, but no, that's so true. It's so funny. The, the self love, I wasn't feeling well last week and I ordered groceries and I was going to pick them up and there were like tulips on sale. So I was like, yeah, I'm going to buy myself flowers. And the funny thing is I wasn't feeling well. So I forgot I put tulips in the order. <laughs> and so the guy handed me the tulips and I was like, Oh, this is so awesome. <laughs> Like, so I think it's kind of funny. We can love ourselves in ways that are different. And I think surprising ourselves is important too. I have a friend who told me, you know, when she got divorced, she started taking herself on dates and that's how she learned to date again. And I just think there's no box. It's what you need. So let's get back to human design so that we can help our audience learn how they can figure out what they need. And I'm happy to share as we go on. So I'm an open book about what you helped me with and we'll dig in. So maybe we'll start with the four types. Yeah, beautiful. So there's four aura types and there's essentially five energy types in human design. So we have manifestors. Mm -hmm. Our manifestors came here to initiate. These are the people who came here to create impact, who came here to make things in the world. We're not here before them. And the way they impact the world is kind of in a rapid, direct way. Our manifestors, if you think about the guys who wrote the book, The Secret, like just think positive and then it happens. That kind of is how it works for manifestors. They say they want something, they claim it, they step into it, and they can impact the world. Now, they make up somewhere between around 6 and 8% of the population. So they're not a big chunk of people. And they came here, you know, on that very impact driven mission and they don't need permission from anybody else to get started. And their work on this planet is really living into the bigness of who they came to be. Mm -hmm. Especially as women, I see a lot of women manifestor types. They find out their energy type manifestor and they're like, that couldn't be me right? Because they've walked around most of their life apologizing for their aura, apologizing for the fact that they do create impact. And each type has their own aura and a manifestor aura is a little bit more selective. It almost feels like if you're up close next to a manifestor on a mission, it almost might feel like they're about to push you out of the way, like move out of my way. It's just this big unapologetic aura that walks into a room. And so 
when we, as manifestors, right, when manifestors don't embrace that and they try to kind of shrink back, well, then they also exchange their power for amicability. They exchange their power so that they can fit in at the lunch table. They exchange their power because they're tired of arguing with their teachers or their partners or their parents. And so for manifestor women, it's really all about stepping back into that unapologetic part of you that's going to own how big you are. And that's where we create impact. But the key for manifestors is really you can't worry about who likes you. You can't worry about who's done it before. You can't be making the same decisions that your inner circle is making and measure yourself up against everybody else there. You're really here to live out your own path. And they have a very specific purpose, which is to create impact. And then the manifestors kind of spark a chain of events that invite the rest of the energy types on board. So the next energy type is the generators. And we have pure generators and manifesting generators. Both of our auras work in the same exact way. I'm a manifesting generator. Generators, their aura is magnetic. Our aura brings life to us. And our superpower is our life force energy. So generators and manifesting generators create sacral energy that here is here to fuel the world. This is the energy that you need in your body to complete jobs. This is the energy that could keep you out of nine to five working on something you love. This is the sexual energy that creates new life. Sacral energy is juicy. It's beautiful. And the world depends on sacral energy. Without it, the world does not turn. So generators and manifesting generators collectively make up around 70% of the population. Our biggest purpose in life is to make good energy for ourselves, for everyone connected to us, and for the planet. And we stay in the best energy when we do things that light us up. That's sort of the tagline for manifesting generators and generators, like stay lit up. What we mean by that is like stay in your power, stay in good energy, stay doing work that's aligned. When you do work that's aligned, you pass that magnetic energy over to the manifestors, the reflectors, and the projectors. Those three types don't make sacral energy. They need yours. So I always say for generators, many gens, imagine that you are a pot of coffee and every day we walk around and you pour into the empty cups of everyone you come in contact with. How good is the coffee? What's the quality of the coffee that you're making? You want to impact the world, make the best coffee possible. And you do that by you staying lit up first. So it's about being unselfishly selfish, taking care of yourself. Make sure the plug is in the bottom of the bathtub, right? That when the water stops running for a moment, you're not going to drain dry, right? It's so powerful when manifesting generators and generators can give from a state of overflow versus a state of lack, right? So that's our work. Now, generators have a more linear path. So they'll be the ones that, you know, really are here to achieve mastery in something, maybe one thing in this lifetime and get better and better and better. Manifesting generators are nonlinear beings. Our path is almost like walking up a spiral staircase. It's not like we don't climb. It's just that we don't walk straight (laughs) and our skills stack up on top of each other. I think the best example I can possibly give earlier, I shared my story of all the things I had done for the first half of my twenties. And then I finally leave that job. And then boom, I I step into a job that was like, whoa, it it was as though I'd been doing that work for 10 years, but it was the accumulation of everything I had ever done that just made me the perfect candidate for the role. You know, on paper, it doesn't make sense. But when you see everything I can do, you're like, oh, why not? Like, she's got all of it. She's got all all the skills together. Perfect. I love that. So I'm going to real quickly just remind our audience that there's a link below. So Mm -hmm. as we're talking and you're like, oh, I think I'm a manifester, which I listen to Kira and I'm like, oh, I think I'm pretty sure my brother's a manifester. I think this person's this, (laughs) right? So as we're talking, if you want to find out what you are, there is a link below. It's a complimentary. And then you have an option to set up time to chat with Kira, which I highly recommend. As you hear, she's great with analogy. She is phenomenally good at breaking this down where it's understandable. So I'll let you continue. Thanks, Kier. Uh, Thank you for that. So for manifesting generators, it's never going to look like it makes sense to the outside world. And I mean, the one thing I wish I had known in my 20s was that every time I took a twist, every time I pivoted in my path, it was all adding up to exactly the person that I needed to be to be the job that I had. Even my eight years in corporate set me up to then be in human design. Nothing is disconnected. We just can't see how it makes sense until we're looking back in hindsight. So for us, generators and manifesting generators alike 
our entire life's purpose is to listen to our gut. We're gut led beings. It's to respond to the world. It's to feel that life force in you rise up to meet the opportunities that come with you and to honor your yeses and to honor your noes. I always like to say, if it's not a hell yes, it's a no. And we make these decisions based off of a feeling in our body, not off of our logical mind. And that, you know, we could talk about that forever, right? But that's really how our strategy is as manifesting generators and generators to respond. Then we have the projectors. So April's a perfect example of projectors. And when I talk about projectors, I always tell a little story, which is about the squirrels in the forest, the squirrels and the bird. So we live in a predominantly generator world, as we know, right? Uh, 70% of the population is here to, is we're the movers, we're the doers, we're the energy makers, we're busy little worker bees. We got stuff going on. So I want you to visualize that a projector is born into the world of generators. And the generators in this story are represented by the squirrels. And so this little projector is born in a forest full of squirrels. And the whole game of life is to get the most acorns. At the end of the day, if you have the most acorns, that equals success. Sweet, sweet, sweet success. And so the little baby projector looks around and sees what all the squirrels are doing and watches them climb up the trees and grab an acorn and bury it in the dirt and then dig over here and find more acorns and put it in a pile. And she's like, all right. I get this game. So she starts to climb up the tree and get the acorns and digs through the dirt and puts the acorns in a pile. She's really good at it. She actually can get more acorns every single day than the squirrels can. But the problem is she's exhausted. She's sick. She's tired. She's burnt out. And all the other squirrels are just like having a good time. Like at the end of the day, when they put their acorns in the squirrel, they're sitting by the fire cracking a beer, like hanging out, telling jokes. And this projector is like... She passed out, right? She's dead. So one day she takes a little walk by the river. And in this moment, she catches a glimpse of her own reflection and she realizes, I'm not a squirrel. I'm a bird. So she looks at her wings and she starts to flap her little wings. And then she takes a flight over the forest just to see if she can. And while she's up there, she notices that all the good acorns are a couple acres away. There's trees with hundreds and thousands of more acorns than where all her squirrel friends are hanging out. So she comes back down and the squirrels say, what did you see up there? And she tells them, I saw all the good acorns are a couple acres away. Why don't I take you? So then she leads and guides them to the trees with the most acorns. And by the way, while she was up there, she also noticed that their assembly line sucked. (laughs) That one (laughs) squirrel was passing it. They were dropping it. It didn't make any sense. So she is able to reorganize and shift how the squirrels interact with these acorns so that they're producing about a hundred more acorns every single day, just in how they're organizing them. But the key is she's not on the ground moving acorns anymore. She's got to be in the sky. And this is, this analogy is so potent. And when you understand the strategy for projectors, it's going to make a lot of sense. But essentially projectors, if you're listening, you're like, oh my God, this is me. You're not an energy being. You're not an energy maker. You may have energy in your body from other energy centers, but you're not a sacral being and you're not here to dig through the dirt. You're not here to climb the trees. Think about how silly it would look from the outside if you saw a bird climbing a tree. Wouldn't that, you would be like, just fly. Jeez, what are you doing? Right? Like, what in the world's going on? Yeah. What in the world is going on? But as projectors, because it, our energy isn't something we can see, mm-hmm. we think we need a function in the world just like everybody else. Yeah. Now, here's the other thing. When the bird takes the moment and looks at herself in the river and brings in that beautiful self-recognition, that is the thing that sparks the magic. The self-recognition of yourself, you seeing yourself, you realizing, I do have superpowers. I'm going to lean into my authentic self. I'm going to be the bird that I am. I'm going to go fly. When you go fly and you go embody the thing that you know you are, you are so magnetic. All the squirrels want to know what's up. They all want your leadership. They all want your guidance. And by the way, you were born to lead. Mm -hmm. But you lead the best when you're invited. Mm -hmm. And you get invited by being the damn thing. (laughs) When you're in the sky, they're like, how would I not ask you what you see up there? I want to know what you can see. So when you see yourself, first you see yourself and then you go embody it. Not because you're trying to get invitations, just because it's you. It's you doing you. You're doing your most authentic thing. People cannot wait to hear from you. They want to be guided. They want to be led by you. And here's the other kicker. As a projector, you can do both. 
Squirrels cannot fly. You will not see a squirrel high in the sky Mm -hmm. doing big vision thinking, getting that big picture view. You can't see it. We just can't do it. I mean, I always, I have to phone a projector friend when I want to go big on strategy for my business. Yeah. I'm like this looking at one little thing and I have multiple projector friends that lift me out. They come in with me with the wings and they pull me up and they're like, let's see everything here. I go, I didn't even think about that. Why? Because that's not how I think. That's not how I function. But projectors can force themselves to be ground beings. You can do the work. You can lift the acorns. And actually, when you apply yourself, you can lift more acorns than we can because you're more strategic, even from the ground. Mm -hmm. you got to give yourself permission to stop doing so much and to start being more. you got to give yourself those breaks to get out of the weeds and into the clouds. Yeah. And so if you are a projector, I invite you to evaluate like what is on your to-do list? What is on your schedule? If you run your own business, are there things you can outsource? If you work in a company, is there ways where you can start showing up more in your authenticity with your gifts and working collaboratively? Because when a generator mm-hmm. has an idea, say the idea comes from a manifester or the company itself comes, something sparked from a manifester somewhere, the generator is going to have the energy and the life force available to do it, but they're going to do it more effectively with your help. And this mm-hmm. is how we can all work together to create a lot of magic. Yeah, I love that. And that points out my team's super excited because they're all getting their human design analogy. So then I'll invite you in to help us work together better. I love that. And part of this is about understanding yourself. But I just did a class on like time management yesterday, a master class. And what I was explaining is when you have your time organized correctly, it seems selfish to the outside world, right? But really, I'm able to fully be here on this podcast with you, giving you full value, honoring your time, honoring our audience, giving them value, because I have the dedicated time, right? So it's not just about me and my energy, it's about what you give to others. And so when I understood this about me being the projector. It helped me a lot as a coach because I always want to consult. And as coaches, we're told, oh, don't consult, let them figure it out. But like when I'm talking to the women entrepreneurs I work with, I'm like, oh, well, what you want to do is so easy. Like I can see it. But this helped me understand, okay, they can't see it. So it is valuable that I share, you know what, we can easily do this. We can easily charge more per hour and really helping them to do that. So So that was a huge gift to me. And I think a huge gift to like our clients we work with too, to give me that permission to be like, no, it's okay. I can actually see something they can't see. I can share it. They can take it and run with it or not. Right. I mean, but at least I can give value in this additional way when I'm working with people. So I really appreciate that. And thank you. Yeah, that's so beautiful. And one other thing with projectors, We do talk about these moments of self-recognition. We do take Mm -hmm. about choosing yourself. When you look up projector, you'll see the strategy is called wait for the invitation. And I don't teach human design in that way. It's not just, we don't want you to sit back and just wait to get picked. You need to choose yourself. You need to pick yourself. You need to see yourself and you need to decide who you are and then go get busy being it. I'm not saying struggle, don't force, don't push, none of that, but just go be her. Go be her and watch what happens When you fly, people are like, what do you see up there? And by the way, if you're hearing this and you're like, I don't want to lead and I don't want to guide other people, that's okay. You will always magnetize the invitations by who you're being. If you say you're not a coach, but you are a jewelry designer, you want people to buy jewelry, cool, go be that. Go be the world-class jewelry designer you are. Go live your life as her. Go show, wear your own jewelry, be it, embody it, and then people are going to invite you in. And Last piece, if you have a projector mm-hmm. in your life that you love, while they do need, you know, the self recognition from themselves, it's very hard for projectors to see themselves flying. It's very hard for projectors to see how high up they are or how effective their advice could be. So the best love language you could ever give a projector is to recognize them for their gifts, is to call it out, is to say thank you, is to say, man, that advice was so spot on. Wow. When you said that, my world changed. I think a lot of times we just take that piece for granted because we're like, of course she knows she's like that. 
She knows she's flying, but she doesn't know how high. She knows she's helping, but she doesn't know how much. So we can also support them in giving them more confidence to fly higher, to fly more, to get back out there and know in helping them in, by encouraging them that this really is their gift. We all need to see each other and, and projectors, they're the ones that see the deep, most deeply of everyone. So projector is going to see you. She's going to call out the things you're beautiful at. If you can do it for her back, do it for her back. Oh, I love that. And then we have our reflectors and our reflectors are super rare. This is the rarest type of all energies. They make up less than 1% of the population and their aura is completely reflective and white and like glimmery. Their energy body is completely open. So In your chart, you'll see there's energy centers. There's nine of them. Some are colored in and some are white. A colored in center, this is called your definition. This is where you are, who you are. This is where you're going to show up consistently. And your white centers are where you're energetically open. This is where you're kind of like a sponge. You take in the world around you. You take in conditioning. And reflectors are actually entirely white, their chart is. And they're purpose is to be a mirror. Their purpose is to reflect back to you, you, to reflect back the state of the community, to reflect back how the world is doing simply by the health and the well-being of that reflector. Back in the day, the reflector would be like the wise woman that sat in the center of the tribe and people would go look in her eyes and know how the whole tribe was doing simply by how she was doing. I also like to think about reflectors as the ocean. So the surface of the ocean is very reflective. It's going to reflect every single thing that the sky does. When it's sunset, it reflects the sun. If a plane comes, a bird, it reflects that. If there's a storm, it will reflect the storm. But below the surface of the ocean is this entire ecosystem that is the ocean. And reflectors do have their own, it's called a gate in human design, the numbers. So you have your own gates, you have your own gifts, you have your own talents, you have your own preferences. So it's really important for reflectors that they're getting plenty of alone time back in their own ecosystem to refill, to refine themselves. And then they can go back out in the world as these beautiful, reflective, sparkly beings, just knowing that they're always going to show back who they surround themselves by. So if you're a reflector and you're like, man, I'm not happy in my life right now. Things aren't going how I'd like them to be, or I feel like I'm not in the right place. When you shift up your environment, when you curate who's in your life, when you change what you read, when you change what you consume, you change. So if you're unhappy, probably in the wrong place, you're with the wrong people. When you change those things, you will change. And that's a really empowering thing reflectors can do. You don't have to just reflect it all back. You get to decide where you want to mirror back. Like if you're living in the wrong town, move. If you don't love your the wallpaper in your house, take it out. <laughs> if you're hanging out with a bunch of friends who like aren't going places in life, the conversations aren't positive, like immerse yourself with new people and watch how you yourself shift entirely. So those are the five types. Can you see how different they all are? Like one is not like the other at all. Yeah, no, it's crazy. And I love at the beginning when you said it's like Myers-Briggs on steroids, right? Because how many different assessments? I know my team does this. I do it with my clients that we go through. And I just think you always learn something about yourself and how powerful to understand really how you should be operating, what your purpose is how you affect others, and also how you want to be treated by others, which I feel like when you go through a human design assessment, you start understanding all of these things. So I wanted to share if it's okay, one more big aha I had when I was chatting with you on our call. And because I was segueing, my brother was taking over my financial firm, I was moving full time to Vixen Gathering, and I had done that for 15 years. So it is a big deal. You do have to grieve. It's a transition, all these things. And what I was struggling with is, you know, I had been on TV for that company, I'd done different things, like I have these gifts, and I didn't want to be the face of the new company. I don't know if you remember us having that conversation, because it gets very hard to extricate, even though you never imagined, I never imagined I would leave my financial practice, right? I thought one of my family members would take it over and it would live in infamy, and you never know what's coming. And also, it does take energy when you're the face of something, if you're trying to wear all these other hats, too. And so I was struggling because here we are doing all these things. Now we have a podcast, right? Like, how could I not be the face of the new company? Like, do we brand Vixen Gathering? Do we brand me? What do we do? 
And I bring this up because a lot of our listeners and a lot of my clients are female entrepreneurs. So this is a big deal for a lot of us. We don't actually want to be the face. We just want to serve our clients and serve our audience. And so I was really struggling with in which way I did that. And in my reading, you actually shared part of my soul's purpose was to be the face and be out there. And I just kind of said, okay, here we go decision made. And now we're here on the podcast, right? On video. Oh my gosh. I didn't realize that's what sparked so much of the visibility, but I just see you here and it just feels like it makes so much sense. Like you're so in your element. Yeah. So thank you. So again, I'm so happy. If you're wondering which of these five types you are, please take advantage of that free analysis. The links below, you can get it immediately. It's probably going to look like Greek to you, but follow Kiera, follow Meeting Your Magic. I love your Instagram because I love reading about all the different types all the time. I think it's just amazing. So again, all the information's below. We'd love you to check it out because I'm sure you're curious. You're probably thinking, what's my significant other? What's this person? So yeah, and as I mentioned, my team's super excited. We're all going to go through this. And when I was sharing with my best friend what I learned, she was like, oh, I want to do it. So it's definitely something that's super valuable to know yourself, to know how to love yourself and how to show up in the world. I think it's really important. I think right now in the world we live in, how you show up is so important because we're trying to please others in the way we're showing up. And we're not doing anyone any favors by doing that. So (laughs) instead, let's figure out how we're supposed to show up, start showing up with courage, with clarity, and with bravery. And I love the title of your company, Meeting Your Magic, because it's true. I mean, things just start happening, right? So I love that. Yeah, I love how you said that. I feel like I always say human design is the opportunity to be your piece of the puzzle, like your actual piece. I feel like the world is just one big puzzle piece trying to come together. And when you play your role, your authenticity, like what you came to do, who you are, when you show up as that, not only are you completing the puzzle, but then you stop occupying the place where you didn't belong. Yeah. Like I think a lot of times we all want to be the corner piece. We're like, I want to be the edge. And it's the edge isn't all the rage. The piece that's the rage is your piece. And if you're trying to shove yourself somewhere where you don't fit, where you don't Mm -hmm. fit anymore, not only are you not going where you're supposed to go, but you're blocking the person who probably is supposed to be where you are. And then all the people whose lives will be impacted and touched by you in that new space, you're not there. Yeah. And when we decide just to show up authentically and we listen to our inner authority, it's called in human design, inner authority is how we make decisions Mm -hmm. and we follow our strategy. Those two things, follow your human design strategy, listen to your inner authority, you naturally end up exactly where you're meant to go. I love that. And you can't get it wrong. You can't get it wrong. It's the beautiful thing. Well, and it's so important because every woman I work with, I talk to, I interact with, they want to live a purpose-filled life. Like that's really at the bane. But women, we've been so conditioned that by giving to others, we're serving our purpose, which is part of it. But you can't be giving away everything to everyone else because you'll have nothing left and you're not giving from a position of strength. So I love this idea. You know, I've always said my driving force is empowering other people to be their authentic selves. So you and I are very much a like in our purpose, and that you do that by showing up as yourself because it gives them permission to do the same, right? And it might be immediate, it might take time, but I just think we all have a deeper purpose. And the more we know about ourselves and the more we listen to our purpose, I like it. What did you call it? The inner voice or what was it called? Oh, inner authority. Yes. I our love inner authority. That. Yeah. Okay. Inner authority, super important, right? That's mm-hmm. your guidance. So awesome. Well, here today has been amazing. We have like so five good. minutes left. So I do kind of want to get back to Kira the woman, because as I said, I think you're awesome and amazing. So first of all, is there anything else you'd like to share with our audience? I know they're super curious about how they can contact you. We'll have most of the information below, but what are things you have upcoming or offers you have on the table so that people can work with you? Oh, thank you so much. So I have a brand new series, which is called Aligned AF, and it's for each energy type. 
So what I've noticed over the past six years is that in my human design sessions, I spend the first 30 to 40 minutes having the same conversation with people before we dive into the nitty gritty of their chart, which is like, what is your energy type and how can you align to this? So I created a series. So now there's a mini course you can take as a prerequisite to a one-on-one session or as a standalone. So it's really potent. It's really powerful. And I wanted to price it in a way that felt like a no brainer for someone that might not be able to have access to me or to a human design reading, but just punch it with all of the things that you really need to start living in alignment with your energetic strategy. So for manifestors, that's informing before you initiate generators and manifesting generators. It's responding projectors wait for the invitation and reflectors are here to wait a lunar cycle, which is like, they have to wait a month to make a big decision. Wow. How, some of these things are kind of hard to digest, right? You hear it, you read it, you're like, what? So I have a whole series just on that, how to get aligned in your, in your strategy to live the most magnetic life. We have a free masterclass, which is called the human design masterclass. And you can sign up for that for free. It's all about the five energy types and how we interact with each other. And I have a human design certification. Well, it's called the meeting your magic certification. And you can learn how to read human design in my meeting your magic method. It's an eight week program. We've actually just kicked off our spring summer session, but we are already enrolling for fall and we're going to sell out because we just did. And we have a wait list. So That fall one is happening September, October, and I'm really excited about that. And that, oh gosh, so many amazing things. Our podcast is coming back. Love it. A lot of fun things up my sleeve. Yeah. Oh, awesome. Thank you so much. So as we wrap up, we talked on so much. I couldn't comment on everything. But one (laughs) thing you talked about was getting in your masculine energy. Mm -hmm. And it happens to a lot of us driven females, right? (laughs) A lot of us do that. And we don't know how it affects our lives. And, you know, I always like to say awareness is 50% of the battle. So if you know you have masculine and feminine energy, because every human being on earth has both, right? And then Mm -hmm. the second step is learning how to transition back and forth when you need them. So this is what part of what I teach in Vixen and our small group coaching and also in our mastermind. So I love to talk about like, what does feminine look like to you? So Kira, as we wrap up here, what would you say feminine looks like to you? And if you had to pick your own signature feminine color, what would it be? Oh, I love that. For me, feminine is any time I'm receiving. Yes. Any time that I can surrender, receive, it's that worthiness of, of being mm-hmm. just as I am. It's the gentleness, the more softness, the flow. And I feel as though the most incredible things for me happen in my life and my business when I remember to surrender to what is. And I remember the universe is here as a co-creator with me. I'm not called creator. It's a co-creator. Like there's two of us. And I have a very magical relationship with surrender, with the universe, with receiving. And it has to match to your point with some masculine doing. I can't Mm -hmm. say I want to have this financial month in my business. And I love to ask this question and I'll share this with the audience. I always say, show me how easy this can be. Yes, It's one of the biggest game changers in my life, no matter what I'm doing, whether it's a goal or it's a problem I'm trying to solve. I say, show me how easy this can be. And when I say it, and when you practice this, I want you to actually feel a slight lift off your chest. I want you to feel what if I'm not doing this alone? You don't even have to believe it. There just has to be an opening, an opening to like, huh, what if maybe this could be easy? Show me how. I promise you it works like magic. When we ask for ease or when we say, show me how magnetic I can be today. Show me how abundant I can be today. I'm inviting someone to dance with me. Mm -hmm. I'm inviting someone to like, let's do this thing. And then there's just this magical sort of response that happens through circumstances, through synchronicities, through the way I be and express in the world where it's just beyond, beyond, beyond what I ever could have comprehended with my logical masculine mind. It's beyond anything. And there's no other way to say it other than magic. (laughs) And for me, my feminine color right now, I've been really really into the sunsets by the beach. So we Mm. live like a five minute walk to the beach and there's this like pinky tone 
that casts itself onto the seagrass. So the seagrass is this beautiful, like creamy white gold. And then the pink sunset kind of falls onto the seagrass. And it's like a muted pink, almost a little millennial pink, if you know what I'm saying, blush tone, gorgeous. And I see that color and I just feel love from the tip of my head to my toes of just like, I feel so held in this beautiful, abundant earth we live in. And for me, it's the ultimate surrender color. In fact, when I try to think about manifesting money, when I think about my business, when I think about the life I want to have, I think about having a baby, all these things. When I close my eyes, I picture the seagrass with that color on it. I always see it. It's like the sparkly, beautiful magic tone. Oh, I love it. That's so beautiful. Yes, I will have to say I learned show me how easy it can be from you. And it is magical. <laughs> I mean, it is right? And all like finding a parking place somewhere, solving a major business issue, like mm-hmm. a relationship problem. Yeah, it's it's really crazy how well it works. I love that. So to wrap up here, Kiara, thank you so much for your time today. I have the saying, and this is kind of, this is actually the purpose and founding of Vixen. I really think the world needs more love right now. So however we can show up with love. So if you had a message to give to the world as we sign off today, what would your message be? Mm, Interesting. I would say we live in a world where everything is measurable. We can measure our income. We can measure our Instagram following. We can measure our weight. We can measure how much money is in our 401k and everything is calculable. And we're always trying to be enough. We're always hoping we're enough, but enough actually means something quantifiable. To be enough would mean there's a baseline that you have to hit in order to reach it. And you are immeasurable. You are immeasurable. You are quantum. You are perfect. And we don't need to try to be enough because enough is so small compared to what we are. And I would want you to know you're worthy now and you're beautiful now and you're perfect now. And that it's amazing when you can even tap into that feeling for a moment and just believe it just for a moment. It's amazing how you can see that spread into the world. Oh, that's such a beautiful message. I think we are going to end on that note. Thank you so much. And if you enjoyed this chat, let us know in your comments below. Let us know what else you'd like to hear about. And please go take advantage of that complimentary analysis. Check out Kiara's work. And we hope you have a wonderful day and we'll talk to you soon. Thanks again for listening to the podcast. If you enjoyed today's episode, be sure to hit subscribe so future episodes are automatically downloaded directly to your device. And if you want access to today's show notes, including links to all the resources we mentioned, visit VixenGathering.com slash podcast. Thanks again for listening, and I'll catch you next week for another episode of The Vixen Voice.